Welcome back everybody to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to introduce a really great speaker and personal friend, Jong Chulier from KAIST in South Korea. And you know, Jong is a professor of the Department of Bio and Brain Engineering and adjunct professor at the Department of Mathematical Sciences of the Korea's Advanced Institute of Sciences and Technology, KAIST. He received his bachelor and master degrees from Seoul National University, Korea, and a PhD from Purdue University, West Lafayette. Before joining KAIST, he was a senior researcher at Philips Research, GE Global Research in New York, and a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. He has served as associate editor of IEEE Transactions on Image Processing, IEEE Transactions on Computational Imaging, and an editorial board member for magnetic resonance in medicine. He is currently an associate editor for IEEE Transactions on Medical Imaging and a senior editor of the IEEE Signal Processing magazine. He is an IEEE Fellow, Chair of the IEEE SPS Computational Imaging TC and IEEE EMBS Distinguished Lecturer. He was general co-chair for 2020 at the IEEE Symposium on Biomedical Imaging, ISB, together with Matthews Jacob. His current research is focusing on deep learning theory and algorithms for various imaging reconstruction problems in X-ray, CT, MRI, optics, ultrasound, remote sensing, and the like. So it's a great pleasure to have him here in the series today, and he will present on generative adversarial networks for medical image reconstruction. John, great pleasure to have you here. The stage is yours. Thank you very much for the kind of introduction and kind of invitation. It's really great, my honor and pleasure to be here to present our work. And as I as introduced, the title is again for medical imaging reconstruction. Here I mainly talk about some of the unsupervised learning approaches based on the generative advisory network models. Okay. As you know, that we are currently living in the era of deep learning for medical imaging. So not only for diagnostic purpose, for example, di diabetic uh, disease from the uh, uh, from the fundus imaging or skin cancer disease, and also there are a lot of startup companies are currently uh, uh, available when working on various uh, aspects of the medical diagnosis. And our, not only those kinds of diagnostic purpose, uh, now deep learning is a state of art for various image processing tasks such as segmentation and image registration. In this kind of task, usually the images are generated from the scanner and then using the deep learning approaches inspired from the computer vision approaches, we are utilizing the, uh, uh, we, are, we are performing the diagnosis and the image analysis. However, listen, the new trend of deep learning is actually for the inverse problem or image reconstruction. Uh, in this case, is, from the sensor data from the scanning uh, scanners, we are interested in forming the high resolution, high sensitive images using the deep neural network. And this is the main topic where I'm going to talk. In fact, we are actually, uh, I'm, we are quite proud of that we are one of the pioneers in this area because in 2016, uh, in Lodos, AAPM Lodo City Grand Challenges, we proposed world first deep learning approaches for the Lodo City reconstruction. At the times, uh, this was awarded in the second prize instead of the first one. The first one is actually still from our former students who is now in the MGH. He actually uh, proposed a 
uh, model based attitude construction approaches, but the, our solution in the second place is, was based on the deep neural network approaches. But in fact, actually, even though this was in the second prize, the impact was uh, more significant. As you can see that the first, this paper is only cited like 10 times, but deep learning solution is nearly cited 400 times for the last uh, several years. Furthermore, uh, Canon and G already commercialized the deep learning solution for the road of CT. In fact, this is unprecedented that the academic research is just commercialized in just short time period. So within just two years, they can actually uh, able to generate this kind of product on the market. In fact, most of current deep learning solutions for the medical imaging construction is based on the feed for neural network approaches. Here, in this case, is why is, is uh, images, for example, the uh, uh, load of CT images or LS images for the MRI cases and X is a ground truth image. And now Q is a neural network parameter with the setup. And we have a lot of tra uh, supervised training data, matched pair data. And then by minimizing those loss function, we can actually train the neural network. This is actually most the simplest and the fast approaches. Once it is trained and for a given data, you can directly instantly generate the high quality images. However, this is actually based on the assumption we, ha we have, uh, we can access the pair labor data. For example, for the low dose data, we can also have a high dose pair match data as well. Unfortunately, those kinds of situations is not common in medical application and dangerous problem. More common application is actually there, is a, uh, there are situations that those kinds of pair data is not available. For example, let's think about the cardiac load of CT problem. Here, using the cardiac CT applications, they, uh, they acquired the multiple phase of the CT images at the different phase of the cardiac cycle. But because of the uh, potential radiation dose, only one set or small set of the phase are acquired at the full dose and the other sets are acquired in the low dose. So the goal is actually to utilize these high dose images to improve the low dose Im uh, CT images. However, this is actually supervised learning is not possible in this situation because the heart is moving in between, there is no pair data. So it's not allowed to actually use the supervised learning for this kind of task. Let's think about the metal artifact removal task in the CT and also MR. For example, this is a CT metal artifact. There are a lot of like a striking and also shading artifact. In order to do the supervised learning, you should have the data without metals and uh, with the metal at the same time. But those kinds of situations is not possible in clinical environment. And let's think about the remote sensing application. For example, satellite uh, uh, using the satellite sen uh, sen imaginary Im imagery sensors. Sometimes in the image sensors are open corrupted with the uh, errors coming from the hardware or coming from the uh, atmosphere. Because of that, you can see this kind of pattern, the artifact as well. In order to do the supervised learning, you should have a pair data for the artifact and the without the artifact, but that's not possible. Let's think about the bioimaging application like a blind, uh, image deconvolution. Here, usually the measurement is like a blurry measurement and the goal is to find high resolution underlying image. But usually the underlying image is unknown. So that's the goal to, for this problem. So pair training is not possible. In fact, this kind of unsupervised learning setup is common in most of the machine learning problem. This slide is taken from the Yan Nakun's ICIP plenary talk. Here, Yan Nakun, uh, this is Yan Nakun compare machine learning as a cake like this. And among the cake, for example, the enforcement learning is like a cherry on a cake, and supervised learning is like an icing on a cake, but unsupervised learning is like a whole genu, whole, whole body of the cake. This implies that most of the machine learning tasks are correspond to the unsupervised learning problem. And to addressing this, uh, uh, addressing this problem is very important in the machine learning task in general. In fact, in order to understand this kind of unsupervised learning problem without matched data, let's think about the classical approaches. 
So one of the classical approaches before the deep learning approach is model-based approaches using penalized least square. Here, this is a regularization term which is coming from the top-down model based on some mathematical principle like a sparsity. And this is a data fidelity, y is a measurement and x is an image, and h is actually the imaging operators. Now the goal is to find the trade-off between the two, and from that one, we can actually obtain the images. The problem with this approach is this top-down model sometimes failed. In that case, we can see some of the artifact. And furthermore, most serious problem here, here is, is this is not an inductive, is not an inductive approach, which means that once you solve this problem, those kinds of knowledge cannot be utilized for another measurement. We need to solve the problem again. And also those problem is uh, based on the optimization problem. This is computation expensive. In fact, another semi-unsupervised learning or semi-supervised learning is based on the CNN prior model. Here, the idea is similar to the model-based ITOTV construction approach, but, but instead of using the top-down mathematical prior models, they're interested in utilizing the CNN-based regularization. Here, Qx is basically denoiser, and this x minus this one is basically noise term. So here, the goal is to find the trade-off between the data fidelity term as well as the noise term at the same time. In these cases, the CNN doesn't need to be accurate, so you can just train this one with a small number of training data. And, but still, the problem is, you know, to solve this problem, this is still ITOT. And in fact, one of the very well-known uh, unsupervised learning approaches, so-called deep image was uh, proposed in 2018 as CBPR. Here, the idea is uh, following. This is why the measurement, and this is image operator, and Q set itself is actually the uh, image generated from the neural network. Here, the goal is for the given measurement, we try to find the uh, uh, neural network parameter to minimize this kind of data fidelity term. In these cases, there is no training data is necessary. So this is fully unsupervised learning approaches. However, the computation of this one is very extensive. It's more expensive than the standard penalized less square approaches. So this cannot be utilized in the routine medical imaging tasks. So the goal is, is any kinds of unsupervised learning approaches, but still feed for the neural network such that we can actually have a quick inferences in a real time inferences. Is it possible? In fact, in order to understand this question, I'd like to give a brief overview about the optimal transport theory from the priority theory. Here, optimal transport is concerning about the transportation of the priority measure to another one. For example, here, mu is the major priority measure in the space of x, and nu is another priority measure in the space of y. And, the goal, and t is actually the transportation map, which actually transport this one probability measure to another one. And in fact, this kind of operation is so-called the push forward operation, uh, 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 operation between the two measures. And the optimal transport, the goal is to find the transportation map such that to minimize some kinds of transportation costs. In fact, this kind of problem is formally formulated by Monge from a French mathematician. He actually uh, formulated in this way. Now here, mu is actually the priority measure in the space X. And now this is a transportation cost from X and its transported version of the sample. Now goal is to try to minimize this average transportation cost and try to find the transportation map. The problem of this one is, this is actually a very complicated problem because this uh, constraint, this is push forward constraint is actually nonlinear to difficult to impose during the optimization algorithm. Instead, the Russian mathematician Kantorovich formulated this one as a probability form. Here, instead of finding the transmutation map directly, he's interested in finding the joint distribution such that to minimize the transportation costs between X and Y spaces. And he, here, uh, in that case, is, we can actually, if we discretize this one, you can actually lead to the linear programming problem. In fact, actually, Kantrovich got the Nobel Prize in Economy based on his discovery, uh, his formulation and his discovery of the linear programming problem. And even though this kind of formulation looks a little bit complicated, for a simple Gaussian cases, optimal transport is easy to find. For example, here, 
This is a Gaussian probability measure with the mean of, a mean of mu and sigma of u. And this new is another probability measure with mv and sigma v. Then optimal transportation map between the two is given by this equation. Furthermore, both of them are Gaussian, IID Gaussian with the different kinds of mean and variance. They can simply formulate it in this way. The reason this is interesting is this is a quite closely related so-called uh, adaptive instant normalization in the image transfer lit uh, in the computer vision literature. For example, here, the goal of the image transfer is like this. This is an uh, input image, and this is a star image. The goal is to, find, to convert this photo image like uh, artistic textures given from the star. So the idea is actually from here in the feature layers, we are now calculating for each channels, calculate the mean and, uh, mean and this uh, uh, variances, and then transport this one to the star. In that case, from this images, you can actually generate the image that looks like this. Another advantage of this counterintuitive formulation is it actually allows, allows very important dual formulation. Here, for example, this is original optimal transportation problem, which minimize, which try to find the joint distribution. Here, the dual formulation he shows is, is given by uh, is uh, given by this uh, equivalent formulation here. Now there is a so-called contrary potential here, and then that he is trying to maximize with respect to this potential, okay? Now the advantage of this formulation is now the optimization problem of this one is with respect to joint distribution, but here optimization problem is with respect to the margin distribution. Because of that, this is easier to find. Here the important thing is this uh, so-called C transform. I will visit this one later. Okay. Now, based on this kinds of brief introduction of optimal transport, we are going to talk about the geometry of GAN and this geometry of the cyclic GAN, which is actually very, very important platform we use for the unsupervised learning for the image consumption. Here, as you know, the GAN is a very important area of the research is in the machine learning. For example, when uh, since it was first proposed in uh, two, uh, 2014, within just four years, we can actually have a very realistic image and large size images as you can see here. And as you know, this is a usually quite popular metaphor for the GAN. For example, some cleaners try to make a counterfeit, which looks uh, like a real money, but police try to find the differences to arrest these criminals. If, if this kind of competition um, continues, then this counterfeit become more realistic and you can actually generate the counterfeit bill that police cannot be differentiate, cannot differentiate. This is the main idea. In, however, this kind of metaphor can be formulated in a mathematically using this kind of formulation. Here, this is a variation formulation of the GAN. For example, here, nu is the probability distribution, Gaussian distribution, the y, and x is actually the spaces which is composed of these uh, uh, faces. For example, one point corresponds to one specific faces. And the goal is to try to find the optimal transport plan G zeta to convert this probability distribution to this one in the space of x. Now, in order to actually make this one is more realistic, you should actually make this kind of transported distribution and the implicate distribution as small as possible. So you should minimize that one under the constant of this transportation in the push forward constraint. In fact, if you actually formulate this one in this way, and if we use this distance using some kinds of statistical distance, this is a primary formulation of the GAN. But if you find the dual formulation that dualizes this distance, you end up with the uh, uh, GAN formulation. For example, if you use uh, F divergences that lead to the GAN or F GAN, or if you use so-called the Weierstrass one matrix, which is coming from the optimal transport with, with this kind of map, this is so-called the W GAN, okay? So here W GAN is quite more powerful than this one because divergence does not, is not actually a matrix, but WGAN is a matrix. So based on WGAN, for example, here, this was actually the optimal transport from a formulation, and this is a dual formulation. Now, as I mentioned, there is a, a C transform, but for this kind of one-lips function, we end up with the minus 
a Barfi here. So that's, we have a much simpler expression of this. This is in fact the Bacherstein uh, formulation of the GAN. So here there's a discriminatum here and there is a generatum here. There, and the goal of the generator is to minimize the distance between the two. And the goal of the discriminator is to maximize the distance between the two. And here, you know, to use this kind of Bacherstein one distance, it should be one lips constant. So that's why there is a one lips penalty need to be minimized at the same time. This is the original formulation of Bacherstein again. Okay. Now, so far, I discussed about some of the more, uh, some of the background material that lead to the psychic GAN architecture, which is actually main interest of my talk today, and it has a lot of applications. So here, in the psychic GAN, as you know, the psychic GAN is try to do the image transfer. For example, here, this is a zebra image, and this is horse images. They are not ma perfectly matched to each other, right? So because actually there is a no exact scene with the same kind of force between the zebra and the, and these horses. And furthermore, for example, this is a pictures, photographic pictures, and this is Monet, Van Gogh, and Cezanne, and Yukiko. They are not perfectly matched to each other, but Sakigan is trying to actually address these kinds of unmatched problem using two generators. One is from X to Y domain, and the other is from the Y to X domain. And now by imposing the psychic consistency, they can actually address the uh, imposedness from the unmatched data. So that's actually a basic key idea of this psychic game for the uh, image trend. In fact, actually our group actually noticed that psychic game might be very useful for image reconstruction purpose. And based on that, we actually try to use that for this problem. In fact, the problem was actually originated from our cardiology uh, clinical partners. And he actually mentions like this kind of challenging problem. For example, here, as, as I introduced before, this is high dose image in the dire surface and the rest are low dose images. And his question is whether using this one to improve, can you improve this quality? So at the time we thought that Maybe this can be considered as a one image domain with the one star, and this is another star. So we consider this one as a star transfer problem. And then we propose this kind of cyclic and natural architectures at the time. And this was the first result we actually obtained. For example, here, this is an input image with a 5% doses. <coughs> this is a high dose <coughs> image, but that's not matched target because this is a different phase of the heart cycle. And now, but still by using these kinds of image transfer approaches between the two, we can actually obtain these kinds of high quality image without altering the chain, uh, structures. For example, this is difference image between the two, only noises are visible and there is no structure changes. Okay, so we are quite intrigued by this kind of empirical finding and try to understand why these kinds of psychic approach, which was originally proposed for the image transfer, is working for the image reconstruction problem, especially for the unsupervised learning problem. So based on this kinds of uh, uh, question, we actually pursue some of the uh, mathematical way of understanding those things. And that was actually uh, the result of our pursuit is actually published in these papers. Now our understanding is now like this. Here, if you remember this, uh, you, if you remember, we have a similar kind of picture for the GAN. Now this is actually a psychic GAN version of those kind of picture here. Now here in the GAN cases, this was actually the Gaussian noises, but now here, this is actually the white space, some samples, some measurement, uh, measurement in the white space with the private measure of new. And this is actually the clean images in the unknown image space of X with the product measure U. Now the generator to find the inverse solution is now coming from the Gzeta. And this path from here to here is coming described by the Ford physics. It can be sometimes unknown or it can be completely known or it can be partially known. Now the goal is now try to minimize this transported distribution with the empirical distribution and also transported distribution with this empirical distribution in the two domain at the same time. It turns out that in fact, 
describe this one as a Bashir Stein Lewin matrix for each domain. It's given in this way for the uh, uh, X domain and this way for the Y domain. But now Bashir Stein, if you find the joint distribution to minimize this, usually this one and this one is not the same joint distribution. So because of that, we are interested in finding this kinds of optimal transportation problem to find the joint distribution at the same time at, for the X and Y space and X space at the same time. This is our formulation of this unsupervised learning problem in the inverse problem. Now, this is actually has a very interesting parallel with the penalized square. For example, here, penalized square, there is a data fidelity term and also there's, there is a data fidelity term here. And there is a regularization term, and this is actually a regularization term from the CNN. But the main difference here is now this is actually for the given Y measurement, we are trying to find the one instant, one instant of X by solving this problem. But here, instead of finding one instant, we are trying to find the joint distribution to minimize the distance at the same time, this cost at the same time. So based on this understanding, we can see that this kind of formulation is in fact the stochastic generalization of penalized risk approaches, okay? So now if from this kind of primary problem, if we find a dual formulation, you end up with the cyclic architecture. There is a cyclic consistent term and there is a discriminator term. Here, especially in the cyclic consistent term, there is a, for example, X on image to the forward operators and then going the inverse operator and measurement from the inverse operator and forward operator. This is cyclic consistent term. And this is coming from the discriminate term for the both X and Y domain at the same time. Now, one of the important observation here is now this forward operator. Now, based on this kind of formulation between the, uh, for the inverse problem, you can see that depending on the problem, this forward operator can be sometimes known or partially known or completely unknown depending on the problem. Now, it turns out, depending on the knowledge of this forward operator, we can have a very nice, interesting form of the cyclic architecture, as you can see here. Now, the first one here is actually the cyclic architecture, standard cyclic architecture here. G set is a generator, and this is another generator, and both of them are implemented in the neural network. This is a cyclic architecture, two, they require a two generator and two discriminator. Everything needs to be implemented using uh, uh, using the deep neural network. The problem of this one is because there is a full deep neural network, the, uh, the training of this one is uh, need a lot of trick. For example, here, uh, because they, one of them, it fails to converge, then all of them fail to converge. So training the cyclic gun need a high skill of the neural network. In fact, actually our graduate students, if actually they can successfully finish the implementing of the cyclic gun for the denoising purpose, then I allow them to do their own researches because this is actually the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this is a proof they can do any kinds of deep learning programming after they can complete this, uh, this kind of natural architectures. But anyway, so this cycle is quite difficult to train, especially for the beginners. But however, what happens is now if you know the knowledge of the forward operator, for example, if a forward operator is a linear convolution operator, in that case, we don't need another generator using the deep neural network. This can be just converted as a linear convolution operation, and we have a one generator here, deep neural network. Furthermore, if you know the forward operator completed, like a compressing single MRI, we'll show you later. In that case, this is no more necessary, and the competition with the generator is not necessary at all. So there is only one discriminator and one generator, which is implemented in the neural network. In fact, this two form is very easy to converse and very easy to train. So you can actually have a much smaller number of data to make this network architecture works well. And if you don't know the forward operator, in fact, there are a lot of cases in the medical applications. I'll show you the later. In that case, you should have to implement this one as a neural network as well. And in that case, you end up with the original formulation of the cyclic architecture. Now, based on this kind of understanding, I'll give you some of the example of how we utilize this one for various biomedical imaging applications. Here, the first example I'd like to show you is the convolution problem in the microscope here. 
Now, the one of the fold operator is now implemented as a linear convolution operation. And the other is implemented as a neural network. Now, this is a corresponding cyclical architecture. Here, this is some of the example we actually obtained for the real in vivo data. In fact, actually for the, uh, for the simulation data, it works very well as well, but I'll show you the uh, real microscopy data as well. This is actually blurring measurement, and this is actually coming from the commercially available software, so-called AutoQuant. And this is a supervised learning using this uh, data. And this is actually, so even though this is, yeah, even though this is supervised learning, this is not completely ground truth, by the way, this is commercial software version. And this is a commercial cyclone architecture, and this is proposed approaches. Now, this is a microtubule imaging, so the microtubule structure should be intact. But in other reconstruction, there is broken in many of the reconstruction, but however, our approach and also our biologist colleagues uh, confirm that this reconstruction is more uh, biologically uh, a uh, feasible solution. And also in the GY plan, you can actually see the much higher resolution. Now in the, uh, to, uh, in the second cases, we are going to talk about much simpler example here. Now for the operator here is actually coming from the compressing MRI. We know the downsampling pattern and we know the field transform. So this is completely known. So because of that, we don't need a discriminator to compete with this one. So we only need to generate one generator and one discriminator. And we are training this one in this way. Now, this is actually the result for the fast MRI data set from NRU. Here, this is actually the four times accelerated imaging and the right column is actually the ground truth imaging. The second column is a supervised training because there is a ground truth case-based data you can train in that way. And this is com conventional cyclical approaches. In the conventional cyclical gun, use a two generator because of that, you can see there is still remaining aliasing artifact. But our approaches is uh, we can completely remove this kind of aliasing artifact and which is similar to the supervised learning approach in terms of quality as well in terms of quantity values as well. Now, in the third cases, is actually the cases we don't know the forward operator at, this, uh, at the same time. This was the example I showed you before. Here, in these cases, from the low dose to high dose, uh, we have a one generator. That's actually the generator we want to have. Uh, by the way, one of the nice things about the cyclic approach is even though the training looks very complicated, we have four neural network, but once it is trained, we only use this one. So that's why this is exactly the same as feed or fold operator in terms of computational quality. Because for example, if we use a unit for both pure uh, feed fold and this kind of cyclical architectures, they have exactly the same architecture. Only thing is this one is basically the wrapper to, for the tra uh, better training, okay? But anyway, for the high resolution to the low, uh, high quality low, uh, image, high to the low dose images, because the physics from here to here is difficult to model. It's very complicated in nonlinear physics. So instead of describing it, it's better to estimate from the data using the deep neural network. So we have another deep neural network generators. Here, this is a result I showed you before. Now, this is some of the ablation study. Now, suppose if we don't use this kind of psychic and structure with the psychic consistency, if we just use the GAN architecture, then in that case, the reconstruction from here to here is looks very good because noises disappear. But however, the problem is this is so natural and so it generates a lot of artifacts. For example, here, there is a lesions you cannot see from here. And in, especially in the difference image, you can clearly see many of things deformed compared to the proposed method. If we don't use identity draws, this identity draws is usually required when accidentally you have a no noise data as an input, you still want to actually retain as it is. Without this one, without using this, we train it, and still there are some of the changes. But however, we, we don't have those kinds of changes in this cycle and architecture. Now, as I mentioned, so, suppose you factor your input without noises, then proposed method doesn't change it. The difference in is basically nothing. But GAN based approaches, and then without identity draws, there are a lot of naturally changing structures, which is not good for the clinical purpose. So 
Now, so far, I, dis uh, I discussed about the three types of GAN architecture. The first two second is using the prior knowledge of the physics. So because of that, it's simplified. It. But the, the last one is without prior knowledge of the physics. So because of that, like we need to actually still try the two generator. So is there any way to actually simplify this kind of standard second gun approaches? In fact, there is. This is actually what we call the switching, a switchable cycle and architecture we listen to propose. The idea is as follows. The left side is a standard cycle and architecture. We have a two generator and two discriminators here. Okay. Now this two generator need to be the different one. So we have a two different kinds of generator and two num uh, twice number of the weight. Okay. But our goal is instead of using two different generator, we are using one generator for this part and another part, but we have a very small size of generator that, that generates some kinds of code to change the law of these discriminators. So based on the code, sometimes this can be the forward operator or based on the code, this can be an inverse operator. For example, this architecture looks like this. This is unit architecture and here this is an instant normalization layer. Now we have a so-called other encode generator. So I talk about the, why this is other encode generator later, but this is actually, we already discussed about the other in, other in before. So the encode generator is generating the target mean and variance for each feature layers. So we, we actually have other encode generator, depending on whether this is a forward pass and inverse pass, it generates two different kinds of code. Now, one of the important thing here is this other code generator is very, very small. We'll show you the size of this one. In terms of weight numbers and in terms of computational complexity, this is negligible. In fact, this kind of idea is actually inspired from the style gun for the image generation. In the style gun, what they do is just exactly the same. They have a generator to generating other encode. And by just changing the other encode from the constant back that they can generate like a lot of realistic images as you can see in this pictures. Now, this is an example whether this kind of other encode is really working for our purpose. Now, this is the same, this is input image, noise image Y, and this is generator with the target code for the X, C, X domain, so noise list domain. In that case, this is the noise encode. Now this generator convert this one as a denoise image. But now if we use a noise code, in that case, this is actually just, just leave it as it is. Now, same thing, for example, this is a high dose image. If you use a noise code, it generates noise. If you use a noiseless code, in that case, it can generate the similar kinds of images as you can see here. So now using exactly the same generator, train generator, by simply changing this, you can actually do this kind of work. And furthermore, once you train it, only thing you need is this one. So you just need the generator and the CX code. Then from the low nose images, you can generate the high dose images. This is, as I mentioned before, this is actually number parameter for the other encode generator. Compared to the original generators, this is negligible. And in terms of flops, this is also negligible compared to the generator. Because of that, we have a much lighter neural network architecture. So even though you have a smaller number of training data, in terms of PSNR and SIM value, the performance degradation is small, but however, in the standard cyclone architecture, the, uh, the differences become more worse. As you can see, we have a more smaller number of training data. Furthermore, one of the nice things about using this kind of switchable Second kind of architecture is that you can actually generate the interpolated images along the optimal transport path. If you remember, the other is basically optimal transport between the IID, two different IID distributions. So because of that, if you actually interpolate between two IID distributions, you can actually inter you can generate the images along the optimal transportation path. For example, here, this is Rodo city image. And this is a target high dose images. Now, this, by the way, this is unmatched, by the way. So if you use other encode generators and then using uh, uh, the parameters, in that case, you have a uh, denoise images. Then this is a different image. 
Now, instead of using that values, we have generating the alpha values in between. You can see very interesting here. Now, noisy level is slowly decreasing along this level, but more important thing is this difference images. Now here in this picture, what you can see is like this. For example, here at the early phase of the denoising, only noise is the background removed. However, at the later phase of denoising, you, uh, you can actually start to see the denoising along the edge image. This is very desirable properties because actually doctor can actually change this upper parameter, this at the inference phase. By the way, this is the inference phase, real time reconstruction. By, uh, by controlling that, they can actually just remove the noise in the background or they can actually find the best trade off what they want. But if, instead of doing that, and if you actually just do the image domain interpolation directly, then in overall ranges, even though it, it looks like a denoising, that this kinds of structural thing is retained at the same time. So there is no feature specific denoising, you can see, as in this kinds of other base generations. Okay? Okay, so then based on this kind of understanding, I talk about some of the advanced application. Here, the first example I'd like to show is a time of flight MRA. This time of flight MRA is MRA angiography without contrast agent, but this usually requires a three dimensional acquisition, but acquiring of this one during the flow is very time consuming. So because of that, there are a lot of Downsampling, especially in the corner view direction, as you can see here, in the acceleration factor of four, acceleration factor of eight. But usually, the images are reconstructed in uh, after this one. Images are uh, seen by the doctor in the axial direction after the so-called maximum intensity projection. Here, so in order to solve this uh, compressing problem. A compressed MRI problem, we actually propose so-called two-step unsupervised learning approaches here. The first thing is now here in this corner direction, we know the sampling pattern. So we have our first reconstructed along the corner direction. And then based on this reconstruction, we are doing the axial domain reconstruction at the, uh, the next layer by improving the MIP images. Now for the corner direction, the reason we're actually doing is like this. The current direction, we know the sampling pattern. Because of that, the cyclic architecture doesn't require any kinds of, uh, only just one generator and one discriminator. And furthermore, we can actually train this one from the multi-core data to generate the sum of square images at the same time. So by doing that, we are doing the core compression at the same time. And from that images, this is sum of square images. Now, we are trying to actually further improve this one to the high quality images. But now the problem is now this is after some of the square images, there is no physics from here to the image degradation. So we should train another neural network. So this is standard cyclone architecture with the two deep neural network generators. However, instead of uh, training this one for the multi-core images, we can only train this one with the somehow square images. This is the image here. The top one is actually the reconstruction using the compressed sensing solution. This is in fact the Philips solution, what they call the compressed sense commercial band solution. And this is our reconstruction with exactly the same data set. If you see the detail of the vascular structure, you can actually have a much more clear view in this image compared to this. In the, uh, in the corona data, such type view, you can see much more clear images. For example, here, this is raw data, and this is a compressed sensing solution, band solution. And this is our construction. You can see much more details of the vessel structure, which was not visible, but still there. This is actually confirmed by our, our radiologists. So we can actually have much nicer construction. Now, another thing I'd like to talk about is so-called uh, application for the matter artifact construction. In this case, we actually implemented, we propose so-called the beta cyclic architecture. Here, the idea is very simple. This is the same as a cyclic geometry we discussed before. But now there's two distance from here distance in the artifact free images and distance for the artifact, meta artifact images. Now, the, in order to actually generate the meta artifact images, you should actually have a very accurate knowledge of the forward physics. So this is quite complicated. We have a beam modeling, photon starvation, and et cetera. Just using the neural network is not enough to learn this one accurately. And furthermore, if you learn the neural network equity in this domain, sometimes this is not working well. So our goal is we have an uneven by, uh, weightings in two domains. 
we have a more weighting of the domain uh, weight in this artifact free generation pass compared to that. And based on this kind of simple modification, we have a significant improved result. For example, here, this is input image, and this is a linear interpolation based uh, meta optic removal, and this is actually the normalized Maran construction. This is our result. Especially in this homogeneous phantom regions, you can see that this kind of striking artifact is uh, significantly reduced compared to other approaches. Now, another example I'd like to talk about is unsupervised mo motion artifact removal, which is actually recently we actually propose. Here, this is MR. Uh, MR is usually, especially for the liver cancer disease, they usually inject some of the contrast agent. And during the, after the injection of those contrast agents, especially in the artery phase, there are a lot of reports, there are a lot of motion, which is coming from the uh, transient sudden motion. So that introduced a lot of artifact in the arterial phase. So in order to address this problem, we are trying to <laughs> utilize unsupervised learning approaches. We have developed, and also ideas we actually developed in the previous ML researches at the same time. The problem, Supervised learning is not possible in this example because we don't have a motionless data which is exactly matched to the motion, uh, motion artifact data. But the main idea is actually coming from here. So in our work, we, in our previous work in the MRM, we demonstrate that if there is a motion, transient motion during the scanning, this is usually introduce a phase artifact along the phase encoding direction. This is a readout direction, and this is phase encoding direction like this. There's a phase error coming from the motion, okay? And even in like a 3D acquisition, for example, usually phase encoding is in the coronal direction, so we have a, this kind of artifact in this coronal direction. But however, if you take the one-dimensional free transport along this y direction, g direction, still this kind of error is a uh, propagated as a phase error along the phase, two dimensional phase encoding lines, as you can see here. Okay? So, our mo main motivation is like this is in order to actually address this motion artifact, now we are actually removing this kinds of case space phase encoding line randomly. And then we train our neural network to reconstruct the image from the subsample data uh, to the full data. For example, here, this is the main idea. So we have a, we train your, our neural network from the clean data after subsampling. And then and this is actually downsampled images, right? And then from here, we are now trying to do the cyclical with the clean data at the same time, okay? And we train in this way, this is basically training using the uh, clean data, match data, using unsupervised way. So my, maybe perhaps you may have a question, why we are doing the unsupervised learning instead of supervised learning? In fact, we did both, but however, unsupervised learning is better because we are now training this one only with the, uh, with, uh, with the no motion artifact images. So if we just do the training with the supervised learning, there is a bias for the uh, no motion data. So instead of doing that, we are training on purpose with, uh, with the shuffling the data in uh, using the cyclical architectures. Once this is trained, then what we do is like this. So we are now reconstructing with the random number of the sample for the reconstruction, because actually many of the samples are removed, the motion samples are phase are removed. This is a last artifact. And then we are basically summing up them together. This is so-called boosting the bootstrap as aggregation. And in fact, we are using those kinds of ideas. This is some of the result. For example, here, this is the input image with like a transient severe motion, as you can see here, a lot of motion artifact in the MR. And this is our reconstruction approaches. You can clearly see this kind of artifact is moving. And this is a supervised learning approaches. Here, they actually, there is a so-called MARC algorithm they actually train this neural network based on uh, based on the uh, based on the uh, uh, simulation data, and then if you learn that one in the in this domain, there are a lot of blurring. And this is a standard cyclical approach with uh, this image with the clean unmatched image. Still, there are a lot of remaining artifacts. But our method 
by removing this kind of motion artifact images, we can actually have a much more clear images, as you can see here. And this is actually the actual reason. Here, this is actually the motion artifact image. This is our construction. You can see this kind of dark shadows that disappear. This is a supervised learning approach mark, and this is so-called psychomedical approach. Still, there is a remaining artifact, as you can see here, but that is removed in our approach, the remaining artifact, okay? And so far, so we discussed about the uh, psychic and approaches for the uh, for various unsupervised learning approaches, image construction approaches. And for the remaining five minutes, I briefly switched the gears a little bit to different problem, which we actually, we actually presented in the last year CPR was what we call the collaborative again or collab again. This has a very interesting application, medical imaging application. So I just briefly touch upon that. So for example, in the psychic approaches, in the psychic approaches, usually if ever there is a four domain, multiple four domain, in order to do the image translation, we need to actually have a generators for each domain, for example, lodos to high dose, for example, one filter to another filter, something like that, okay? And however, you know, but for example, let's think about, this was actually originally motivated for the MR. For example, MR cases, there are T1, T2, and um, a lot of different contrasts. In order to actually translate, you need this kind of approach. But this is not efficient because you need a lot of training and a lot of neural network. But so-called stagnant approaches is utilizing just one neural network. Based on that one, this neural network is trained such that any combination can generate. However, this is not the scenario we want because in our real scenario, for example, there is a remaining contrast. We are utilizing the remaining contrast to synthesize the missing contrast. That's actually the, usually the case. So our goal is to try to utilize the remaining contrast to generate another one. For example, this is the case. We have a T1 flare imaging is missing and using the other three images, we are interested in generating that. This is actually generated imaging and this is second approaches and second approaches and target approach, target real data. You have a much more clear image. In fact, in this is the reason this is much better than psychic is we are now utilizing every information, not just one information. We are utilizing every information. That's why it's better, okay? Now, yeah, the reason actually I'm bringing up, up this issue is not just like a, this kind of impending problem, but there's more fundamental problem, which actually uh, recent, uh, published, which was published in uh, uh, Nature this year, uh, Nature Machine Intelligence this year, this is try to address a fundamental clinical question doctors want to answer in the clinical environment. Which contrast, MR contrast, is important? For example, in this kind of brain cancer disease, uh, uh, diagnosis, what doctors are doing is a lot of uh, radiomic studies. Radiomic studies is usually based on the segmentation of these cancers, okay? And then based on the margin of the cancers or shape of cancer, they actually extract some of the descriptors. And then based on the statistical analysis, they try to find the link with the disease and the progresses. Okay, so our goal is like this. Now suppose that in this kind of test, there are like a T1, T2, and T2 flare and T1 gadolinium contrasts are used in this kind of segmentation task. Now our goal is to find which kind of con contrast is most essential. That means which cannot be removable. If it is a loss, then we should acquire again. But, other, but we want to also verify which contrast is redundant. Even though one is missing, we can still have a no effect in the diagnosis purpose. So what I, what I did is as follows. This experiment, what I did is as follows. From the original data, we train the neural network, okay? We train the neural network, and from the neural network, a segmentation network. Now, instead of the original network, we are now using the T1 images removed and we synthesize from the remaining data, and then apply to the segmentation. Same thing, T2 is removed and apply uh, uh, the in, uh, impure using the remaining data, and T2 flare and T1 got the renewed. 
And this is a segmentation result here. This is actually the blue, uh, the green one is whole tumor, and red one is a tumor core, and yellow one is effective coma uh, tumors. For example, in all these combinations, it looks very similar to the original ground truth, right? However, there is a very yeah, there is also this part, but there is a one very important observation we can obtain from statistical analysis here. Now this is a dice score. This is dice score, and this is actually for the whole tumor and tumor core and effective coma. Then if actually uh, remove T1, T2, T2 flare, nothing changes. There is no statistical differences. However, and also in the, uh, the gadolinium contrast, if you remove it, there is no changes in whole tumor and tumor coma. However, effective tumor core, there is statistical significant differences. What does it mean by that? In fact, the gadolinium, effective tumor core is actually the area where the, the, the angiogenesis is on progress. So there are a lot of vasculatures are generated, created, okay? In fact, what happens is gadolinium contrast agent is actually usually targeting those kinds of vessels, right? So if you actually have a known gadolinium contrast, those kinds of angiogenesis in the areas is difficult to see from the intrinsic contrast only. So that actually confirmed the law of the gadolinium in terms of effective tumor cores. But other than that, there is, a, there is no statistics differences. Then, which means that gadolinium contrast, depending on the medical application is important, but on the other hand, other kinds of intrinsic content can be generated. For example, here, this is so-called the magic, uh, magic sequence from the GE. They actually generate the multiple contents from the one simple sequences. All right, this is quite good, but one problem is usually T2 flare images. For example, here, T2 flare images. This is real T2 flare images. You can see some of the lesions here, but in the magic T2 flare images, it, it disappears. But however, Based on our approaches, we can actually generate this kind of real T2 fly image because there is no contrast agent at all. So this is only intrinsic contrast. You can generate it. So you can see that this T2 flare, the lesion is actually appears and also this kind of wiggly architecture which is coming from lesion is appears in these approaches. Okay. So, so far, which I mentioned that the medical imaging is a very important area for the deep learning, especially if we're interested in image reconstruction, that's also very important frontiers of the machine learning. And also for the, a lot of unsupervised learning in medical image reconstruction problem, GAN is very important. And especially psychic GAN, we found a very useful for unsupervised feed for neural network print. Also, if you have a multiple kinds of contrast or multiple kinds of information you want to utilize, those kinds of collaborative GAN approaches was quite useful. Okay, with that, I'd like to conclude my talk and thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. And let me give you some applause. I hope you can hear it. Yeah, I can, I can hear that. <laughs> so because our audience can't clap, we have prepared something for you. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for this really great presentation. It's, I think it's a really an important issue to address that uh, most of the time we can't really use supervised learning. I mean, it's very difficult to produce studies where you can really get into the supervised kind of learning schemes, in particular, if you think about metal artifact reduction and so on, because you need the same data set with and without metal artifact. And this is actually not so easy to produce. So this is a really very interesting approach to follow. Uh, I have a, a couple of very basic questions just, just to make sure how you typically set up the, the learning problems, because what we see quite frequently is that uh, sometimes things are used on, on patch or image level, but what you've been showing is that you process the, the entire image with a single network, right? So you're do, not doing any patchwise processing. No, no, depending on the application, we sometimes use a patch operation or the entire images. Okay. Depending on the but however, because this is a CNN, even though you are training the patch level, 
but the inference mm-hmm. is all you know, for the entire user. <laughs> Uh, I, I just wanted to make sure because some of the artifacts that you showed, I would expect to have a, a global characteristics and others have a, a more local one. So depending right. on the type of artifact or, exactly. or image characteristic that you are expecting, you do patches or you do global images. Is that yeah, that's right. how, exactly. how we can, can summarize that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And is it... If, I've asked some of the things that you've shown 2D and some are 3D or is it mostly 2D? Um, because uh, it's not so... so <laughs> I didn't understand yeah, from right. all the applications whether it was a 2D or 3D application. Yeah, actually, the, even though 3D data I show you is actually the 2D in two different planes. So one is in the corona direction. After that, we are applying in the uh, axial direction. The reason we, we are not utilizing the 3D network is it's actually GPU memory is not yeah, friendly, OK? That's mm-hmm. one issue. And also, if you want to use the 3D data, the number of training data for the 3D training is much mm-hmm. larger than the 2D training. Because 3D is the example itself is actually the just one case is instead of the 2D cases, each slice is a new data, right? So, but you can always address the 2D, 3D problem by breaking a 3D volume into slices and then working with different slice orientations. Exactly. That's Just, right. Yeah. So I think this is very important important also for everybody who's now excited and seeing the different GAN methods and want to apply them, how they can, you know, a couple of practical tips, uh, how they can actually apply it in their own work. So this yeah. is why I was asking uh, these questions. And... Uh, also, one thing that that I find uh, kind of interesting when you work with guns is, mm-hmm. uh, I think, also the the sampling or how you generate the data in the two different domains, in particular the cycle guns that you have been showing. Yeah. Do you have any tips about that? How you would how we would set this up? How you yeah. would generate this, or or how you select appropriate data sets that you get a, a good, um, yeah, generalization and um, that you just end up with a good learning algorithm? Yeah, so that's such a very important question because actually many people ask that this is because we need high quality images anyhow. So some people said this is not an unsupervised learning in, in per se, for example. However, this kinds of unpaired high quality, obtaining unpaired high quality images extremely easy in many of the cases. For example, let's think about the low dose and high dose conversion images, right? In mm-hmm. that case, usually unmatched different patient data with the high dose image, even with a different organ, is very easy to collect and compared to the low dose data. For example, in the cardiac imaging as well, I showed you some phases already in high dose. So those kinds of things is easy. For example, let's think about metal artifact removal. So mm-hmm. without uh, image without matter artifact is most most of the times you can easily collect it. The problem so only thing is you just need to sort it out those images without matters and with the metal artifact and the, with the matter artifact. For example, in like a, for example remote sensing application, that's actually one of the t- project we conducted with the Korean NASA mm-hmm. version of NASA. So they they have a satellite system, but in that case is. Those kinds of errors only occurs in some cases, and most of the times it's okay. So that means we can actually use a high quality images and a low quality images by just like a splitting the sample. So it's like a, those kinds of manual data splitting is additional tasks you require. But other than that, it's most of the times it's easy. So that's why I, I'm quite excited about utilizing the second approaches as a main tool for the supervised learning because that's ideally suitable for many of the medical engineering scenarios. Mm-hmm. But, and, and do you have any hints on, on data balancing or do, do uh, you, for every condition a, you have the same number of samples? Yeah, or? usually we have the same number. We have the same number of the data. And if, if some of these conditions are more difficult to get, uh, is there also tricks how you can deal with imbalance and stuff like that? Oh, uh, we usually collect until we have the similar number of data. For example, usually the artifact image is, uh, is usually less 
compared to the artifact free images in many of the cases. So collecting the artifact free images is not that difficult. But yeah, so if you, we have a set of artifact images, usually we just balance that one together. But however, having said that, there is some of the cases that collecting high quality images itself is also difficult. Like for example, like the images I show you about the deconvolution microscopy. Deconvolution mm -hmm. microscopy here. In that case, a high quality images should be coming from the ground truth images or like high resolution underlying images, right? Mm -hmm. But that's not usually easy to obtain, okay? Because that's actually the goal. So in those kinds of situations, what it did is as following, for example, we just utilize the conventional software or conventional software or conventional algorithm to generate the high quality deconvolution images, okay? Mm -hmm. But among them, there are a lot of images with the artifact and mm -hmm. some of the images without artifact. Mm -hmm. Because put it out, it has without artifact, okay? And then train with that way. So of course, there is a, some of the qualities may be limited based on those kinds of numerical solutions. But one of the most important thing we found is if we train in such a way, mm -hmm. then training in such a way is better than just original ground truth image we provide, even though we actually use the same data set, for example. Because the reason is during the psychic and training, they are, we are trying to, the neural network is learning the decision instead of one instance. Mm -hmm. So based on multiple realizing of the different kinds of instances, by somehow neural network seem to be learned uh, in the some of the basic <laughs> knowledge of those kinds of decomposition or the developing process, mm -hmm. not biased in the specific one samples. Yeah. Did you also look into cases where you are out of this distribution? Let's say uh, the generalization of the approaches. Is there is there anything that can be said about that? So let's say you, you trade the cyclogon approach for for head, and you try to apply it to the abdomen. Okay, that's a good point. Yeah, in that case, there is some limitation. So we it's better actually to yeah, it's, it doesn't need to be necessary to the same person. For example, but however, different organ, for example, we actually use a uh, listen to using the psychic gun for like a fetal conversion, uh, a city corner conversion. In that case, if we actually apply that on train with the health data and apply for the abnormal data, then there is some of the biases. We should do some kind of fine tuning with the, by mixing the data so a little bit. But mm -hmm. other than that, actually, so the, in terms of subject biases, we don't see too much. Cool. I had a question about the adaptive instance normalization, and I found that very intriguing that if you were varying this alpha, that you could essentially see in the difference images how the amount of noise is reducing. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. showed essentially from alpha 0.5 to zero. Yeah. And I would be interested is if you choose alpha equals to one, will you have a, a zero difference image? Is that? It, it, yeah, that's actually the. Yeah, that's a, that's actually. Uh, uh, yeah, what uh, that's the uh, that's actually the reason because the alpha equal one. In fact, actually, that's actually just like a generating without any code. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and this essentially means that you're you're generating a code that produces identity. Is that? Is that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So in that case, is this is based autoencoder. That's actually that I show you here, for example mm -hmm. here. Uh, but you're you're using a, a unit type of network, right? So your yeah, auto encoder should be able to produce exactly yeah. identity. Yeah, that's right. This was if you actually have a CY code, then it's basically the auto encoder. Hmm. Here, same thing. In, in this X domain to CX code, it basically does nothing. Uh, auto encoder. Mm -hmm. And is there is there a theoretical guarantee that exactly this will happen, or is this because you? If, it's like a constraint that just enforces the solution to do this. Yeah, because that's actually coming from the training or uh, training phase. Training phase is actually coming from like uh, here in the training phase. By actually learning this code, we are generating this one as a denoiser by using this CY and the code is generating the 
noise generator. So it's it's essentially a constraint in the optimization yeah. that enforces That's the right. behavior. And also G is the same the same uh, autoencoder anyhow. Yeah, so <laughs> ratioing. Yeah. Okay, so there's uh, a couple of more questions here. So there's actually plenty of questions. So you did a very inspiring presentation. And the next question is, uh, you mentioned that the standard cycle gun is hard to train as all four networks need to converge. So well, the two of them are actually the same, but uh, do you think that the case when using paired data samples to partially train the cycle gun in a supervised manner, uh, would, that, would that help? What are your experiences with cycle guns when you use paired data? Okay, so that's a very interesting question. In fact, actually, we didn't actually pre-train with the supervised learning force mm -hmm. and then do the, uh, uh, the cycle and training later. But instead, one of my students compared the experiment with the cycle and training with the pair data. Okay, first a cycle and training with a, with a perfectly on pair data, for example, totally different person and same, uh, same slices from the same person, for example. Okay, mm -hmm. what I found is, yeah, unlike our expectation, in contrast to our expectation, totally unpaired training is generalized better. Okay. Yeah, because actually our, the, in terms of quality is also is better. So our expectation is, the reason for that is because if it is untrained, unpaired, if it is, one of the, the, the reason that, for example, so far learning usually end up with blurry image is actually its biases to specific sample pairs, okay? Mm -hmm. But however, in the unsupervised learning with, without any match data at all, in that case, as I mentioned before, we are basically learning the joint distribution such that all the combination of input pairs and output pairs, uh, uh, the corresponding cost in minimizes, okay? So because of that, it seems like uh, they actually consider all those kinds of combinations on combination during the training. That seems to be improved some of the generalization capability of neural network. That's our understanding. Yeah. We don't have any theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that improved the generalization. Yeah. So you're essentially saying that a, a supervised training uh, is intrinsically because of the pair training sets bound to be overfitting uh, to some exactly. locations. Yeah. Yeah. And if you do the, the distribution matching, you have much more variability that you can introduce by the uh, different pairings and different setups of the gun type of losses that exactly. you can avoid a lot of the, the overfitting. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh -huh. I was very intrigued about the identity loss that you introduced. Mm -hmm. I think that was a, actually a, a pretty cool concept and it's an additional information that we have often in, in medical imaging because mm -hmm. the it's not such a large domain shift because we know there's still information available in the original image that should be preserved. Mm -hmm. can, can, you, can you explain the, the identity loss a bit more, yeah. what, what you're doing yeah. exactly at this point? Because I think yeah. it's, a, it's a very important feature. Um, okay. Yeah, but by the way, this is our invention, and not our invention, by the way. This is already coming from the original psychic and literatures. Uh -huh. okay? But here, the identity loss is a little bit different from the input and output identity loss. The identity loss, what I say is, for example, here, when you impose identity loss, instead of putting the sample from X domain, we put the sample from the Y domain, for example, B domain, mm -hmm. as an input of GAB instead of mm -hmm. X domain. In that case is the network should work as a fixed point operator because it, does, it shouldn't change this. That's actually the fixed point constraint to imposing in this one. So by doing that, and, uh, in, for example, if there is a, some kinds of signal which is less noises or no noises coming, the neural network should work as a fixed point rather than converting it. That actually gave some kinds of uh, uh, stabilities in the neural network, yeah. And is this just an L2 or L1 loss or? It, 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 we, um, um, depending, uh, it, it doesn't matter too much. We usually use L1 norm, but yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
but it could also be a perceptual loss or something like that, right? Yeah, it could be, but we don't use identity loss as a perceptual loss. We usually use adversarial loss plus perceptual loss, but mm -hmm. not in this kind of cyclical application. But identity loss is usually L1 or L2, I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very interesting. Okay, so then there is a question here. What... Um, so, okay, this is, this is a, a common question about Gantz and... Mm -hmm. Uh, a common problem for images synthesized by Gantz is that although the images look realistic, some structures are incorrect, which do not exist in the ground truth images if ground truth images are available. With the cycle consistency and depending on the forward and inverse operators, can you guarantee that all the synthesized structures are faithful? So yeah. it's essentially a question about trust. And I think you showed yeah, a couple right. of very good examples that yeah, that's right. Very For example, here, this is a, exactly the case. Again, generate very natural images. But however, this is a not ground truth. So this is a very dangerous situation in the clinical environment, right? It can actually generate mm -hmm. uh, artificial features. Now, psychic on, if actually use a psychic consistency, by, we have a much more control about this, for example, we, we, because we know each row of the parameters. For example, if you have some of that, yeah, it's not totally artifact free, depending on the parameter, there is an artifact, but depend, if you see some of the artifact, you know which kinds of parameter should be controlled to actually avoid those kinds of situation and to generate like a bill like image, okay? Furthermore, another nice thing about this, especially the, what you call the optimal transport driven cyclic architecture we discussed here is now, if you know the prior knowledge about the forward physics, like a linear convolution or even deterministic, okay? Mm -hmm. In that case, this gives a very strong uh, constraint for the solution set you can generate, okay? Because if you actually generate some artificial images, if you pass through the forward operator, it cannot match it to the images sometimes, right? The measurement, right? Mm -hmm. So that means only by having this kind of things, you actually only allow the solution which generate the same kinds of measurement. That's actually the like uh, uh, that's actually the uncertainty you can actually this impose. And furthermore, neural network those kinds of uncertainties seems to be addressed by using the training from the G set. So usually, what happens is, especially in this kind of form of the architecture, we don't rarely see those kinds of artificial features, especially if you have more knowledge about the for the operators. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a, 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 quite a few questions in here, and um, some of them go into very similar directions. Um, I think one that I also find very interesting here is um, by Alex, and he's asking, in your motion compensation approach, have you tried to utilize the motion corrupted K-space data in a second step when you're motion is rigid, like by registration to the compensated image? Is that something that that seems beneficial okay. or? So the, yeah, actually, in fact, actually the motion, uh, so if I understand the correctly, then from here, uh, yeah, actually the problem is, so we are, yeah, yeah let, me, let me simplify my answer. The, the reason we actually develop in this kind of random subsampling is we don't know which kinds of case space data is missing, uh, is corrupted. And mm -hmm. also it's not feasible. We try to actually uh, see from the real data for the LIMA, LIMA uh, MRI, which kind of case space is corrupted, but it's not feasible at all. But however, there is some case space data which is incorrect phase, even though it's not small. By removing this and reconstructing it, you can actually remove, you can significantly reduce those kinds of motion artifacts. Okay? That's actually the, the reason actually we try to do this kind of blind way of random bootstrap subsampling is try to avoid the motion compensation because usually motion compensation takes time. And also mm -hmm. uh, sometimes depending on the motion model and then 
a mark, uh, sometimes it's difficult to estimate it. So mm -hmm. Gorillas, instead of doing that, we try to actually randomly remove and then using the boost space of sampling, we try to actually improve the images. And then, yeah, basically we are just, just converting this motion estimation problem as a compressing MRI problem. Mm -hmm. and, but instead of just using one instance, we are just utilizing the multiple instance of this and the booster aggregation improve the image quality furthermore. And that's why actually we end up with this kind of high quality images. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But perhaps we could actually model those kinds of motions. In that case, is one of those kinds of paths could be changes with the motion compensation. That's too, that could be possible, but we haven't thought about that one. Yeah. Then there's another question here um, and it's, yeah, essentially about how, how you measure performance. And the question is, sometimes the algorithms achieve very good performance in, let's say, structural similarity index or with respect to PSNR or quantitative measures. But uh, sometimes they perceptually are different and sometimes small details are missing and things like that. So what are your experiences in, in generally probably image quality assessment and how to set up these things in a good yeah. way. Yeah, that's actually another reason actually we prefer this unsupervised learning and such kind of approaches. The reason is, for example, here, this is an example. Yeah, we actually use, because we are only training this one using the, uh, the, uh, the motion-free data, we could actually train this one using the supervised learning as well. And in fact, in terms of SIM and also in terms of PSNR, that's much better. But uh, however, our clinical collaborator didn't like the result because it's too blurry. So even though motion is removed because it become blurry. And so because of that, in terms of image quality and radi radiological evaluation score, it's not good. So that's why we actually instead, even though there is a match data in those examples, for the uh, no motion cases, we, that's the reason we actually use unsupervised learning. After we actually, one of the nice things about the unsupervised learning is actually because of the cyclic gun, there is a discriminator term, which is trying to match the distribution. So because of that, all the detail is not overfitted. And so details are still remaining, okay? Less blurring. So, uh, but however, as I mentioned, in terms of PSNR and SIM score, if there is a references and match data, supervised learning is better, but in terms of image qualities, even with the pair data, it's better to use a psychic architecture. That's our observation so far, yeah. Thank you. Jong, uh, there, there's more questions uh, in the chat, but mm -hmm. we slightly start running out of time. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm really amazed by the work that you're doing and the many very good ideas that you have shown here in this presentation. It's, it's a real pleasure to have such presentations here. And I, I would like to ask you, would it be okay if there are additional uh, questions that pop up if I forward them to you? And yeah, uh, would course, you also yeah. be able I'm to answer I'm them happy. later? I'd be happy to answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This, is, this is really exciting work. And I really want yeah. to thank you for this presentation. So oh, my pleasure. Thank you. I much. have another round of applause for you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the kind of invitation and also all the more yeah, so thank you. It was a real pleasure to, to have you here, at least virtually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Hopefully I can see you in person in soon. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. As you've seen, there were plenty of questions, many interesting points that came up in the discussion. And I can tell you, the discussion is not over yet. So as you heard, Jong agreed to also answer questions if you transmit them to me. So you can leave them as comments to this video, or you can also send them via social media, on our LinkedIn groups, on our Facebook groups and the like. You will find the links here in the video description. So please engage in the discussion. I'm very sure that Jong is very much interested in hearing your thoughts and questions about his work. I also put the references 
to his publications here in the video description and I'm very sure that he will be happy to be working with you. So please stay in contact and if you liked this presentation and if you want to know more about deep learning and about the applications in medical imaging but also all other kinds of applications then please stay tuned, subscribe to this channel and follow us here on Beyond the Patterns. Thank you very much for listening and looking forward to meeting you in one of the next videos. Bye bye.